Good afternoon. Um, my name is Marco Greco. I'm a Nickel developer here at Couchbase, and I'm here with uh, Clarence Staurum, a trainer at Couchbase, and Brant Burnett, the lead developer at CenterAge. And we are going to talk about migrating from relational. What I am going to cover is some practical considerations for you um, for migrating data and application. Clarence is going to talk about modeling, uh, and then um, Brandt is going to talk about his experience at CenterAge. So uh, what I'm going to cover very quickly is some mapping in between nomenclature type and data modeling, then what you have to do for uh, migration data, um, considerations for the um, business logic migration, and finally, once you've migrated your data and your application, what sort of monitoring you can do very quickly to see that everything is hunky-dory. So um, in relational um, systems, you've got databases containing tables, uh, containing rows, all neatly organized in uh, a set of homogeneous columns. In NoSQL um, systems like Couchbase, you've got buckets containing documents, all organized in fields which can actually vary from document to document. So um, this is where you're migrating to. Um, you also have to migrate types. And while um, binary and logical numbers pretty much map to floating point numbers in JSON, uh, and characters um, varying or fixed uh, size and localized or not, pretty much mapped to UTF strings. For things like date, date times, and timestamps on one side, and intervals on the other, there really isn't that much of a support on the JSON side. So um, the timestamps will be handled um, via strings, and the intervals will essentially be handled either as floating point numbers or as strings, depending on, on the actual format with functions uh, in the millis family and in the duration family to convert from one to the other. In terms of modeling, on the one side, you have got a um, homogeneous set of data organized in um, normalized tables, all nicely linked by relations. And on the other side, you've got a document which is denormalized um, and uh, quite um, complexly structured, and your job is to essentially take the left side and turn it into the right side. So um, how do you migrate the data? I'm going to give you a pretty quick um, generalized algorithm. Then we're going to have a look at commercial tools, a couple of open source tools, and then finally a couple of cache-based tools to uh, import data from, uh, from files. The migration process, roughly speaking, looks like this. You scan the system tables catalog, and for each table, you scan the um, constraint system catalog and determine the, um, the primary key columns. And once you've done that, you know how to generate your document key. Then you prepare a select statement. You run um, an ESQLC uh, describe of some sort. And that will give you the um, actual column name or expression name and type of each column in your table. You start executing the select for each row. Then you have to generate a primary um, a document key from the primary key columns. You then generate a document from the description of the projection list and the column values for that particular row. And finally, you execute an insert into a cache-based bucket using the document key and the document as placeholders. And that's, roughly speaking, all there is to actually move data initially from a relational database to Couchbase. Then we have the problem of actually denormalize the data, but that's Clarence stuff. I'll, uh, I'll leave it here. A um, couple of tools. Talent um, from 5.3, they've got a connector for Couchbase, and that's 
split in two parts. We've got T cache space input and T cache space output. Um, input is what you're going to use, and essentially, um, it uses a description of the data fields that you're going to, uh, um, to import. It's got all sorts of cool uh, and useful things like uh, um, the data editor and all that kind of stuff. And it will do exactly that process whereby it will take the uh, fields in your definition, it will take the um, column values for each row, and it will produce a JSON document. On the traditional ETL world, you've got Informatica with uh, Power Center and Cloud, which does, roughly speaking, um, the same thing. And bot tools are OGBC and JDBC um, based. If we move um, a little bit on the uh, open source front, we have got an IFTA tool by uh, Laurent Dagan, who's a um, professional services um, uh, member, a team member in, um, in Couchbase based in France. And he's written this really nice and long blog post where he essentially gives you all the steps that you have to do from this journey, from your relational um, database um, to Couchbase, all the way to the actual code. Um, so his code is Java-based, but in general principle, uh, you can use any other language. And his actual tool um, starts from um, Postgres. But again, uh, in general principle, you can use exactly the same thing for, for anything else. And you've got there the URL for um, the blog and also um, the URL for the um, GitHub repository for, um, for the source. In Europe as well, um, again, professional services, Manuel Hurtado has written a similar thing with a blog post and an open source tool. Again, Java-based, but this one uh, migrates um, to, um, to Oracle. The different thing is that um, here you get more of the tool and less of a blog while Laurent gives you a really good description of, uh, um, of what happens. Lastly, uh, but not least, uh, something written by yours truly about two decades ago, i.e. Um, for completely different reasons, I wrote a client-side SQL-like scripting language with a whole bunch of interesting things like expansions, like in the Born Shell uh, data-driven operation as in Orc, um, on-the-fly aggregation, um, statement resurrection, all that kind of stuff. And it struck me when I was hired by Couchbase that I could actually use this to move data. So I wrote a user-defined routine for a JSON library, um, a uh, Couchbase driver. And that gives you, roughly speaking, an idea of, well, that is actually a working statement which will connect to DB2, connect to Couchbase, and you can do a select and uh, redirect that select into an insert to Couchbase using um, two functions to generate uh, a primary, uh, a document key from the um, uh, column values and a document from the uh, projection list and the column values. Finally, um, on the Couchbase front, um, today in 4.6, we have announced a couple of um, file movement utilities called CB import and CB export. Um, what those require you is to essentially have the data on a file. So first you have to export it. But once you do it, um, you can use uh, CB input to migrate the data. And it does that against the uh, eventual persistent engine. So you skip completely the, um, um, the nickel layer. Moving on to business logic, um, DDL, uh, we're going to have a look. Um, then um, statement blocks, um, sequences, joins, and transactions. Quick language comparison. You can see on the DML side, roughly speaking, the two languages um, match. On the DDL, on the other hand, you have a plethora of stuff on the left side, but on the right side, only create index and drop index. Um, in terms of query operation, again, um, things pretty much uh, match, except that you have more structures to deal with uh, 
uh, nesting and unnesting of arrays and things like that. Um, again, predefined schema uh, versus uh, flexible schema. Um, SQL types versus JSON types and sets of tools versus set of JSONs. But roughly speaking, language-wise, we're, we're there. So in terms of DDL, as we said, um, Nickel only does create index and drop index. So if you've got anything else in your application, um, quite frankly, that has got to go. The one exception is temporary tables. At some stage, you will want to materialize stuff, temporary um, intermediate results, and store them somewhere. What you have to do in this case is either you store them in memory, or you can use insert um, into select from. So you materialize your results, and in your projection list, what you're going to have is a new type field, which is probably going to be the um, name of your temporary table. But since you will have multiple requests, you have to differentiate this for multiple users. So you will also have to generate a unique ID so that um, each session can actually use its own temporary table. And then nifty, when you want to get rid of it, you just have to delete the document with the um, materialized results. Views uh, essentially use the underlying key spaces. If you want to uh, achieve similar stuff as views, as in restrict the um, results returned by the actual select, then you can use um, functional indexes or partial indexes, um, and it will achieve the same result. Statement blocks like triggers and procedures, they're not in the language yet, so you have to handle them at the application level. Sequences, which is something that in relational you use an awful lot, um, you have two options. One is on the nickel front, you can generate unique IDs with the UID function, and that's a simple enough um, solution. Um, on the other hand, if you're using uh, get and set, one of the things that you can do is you can generate counter documents which are um, incremented atomically. And here's an example in, uh, in Python on how you do it. You essentially use the counter function, and that will initialize it to start with, and then you can increment it and decrement it with a delta. In terms of joins, um, two types. Um, we have straight lookup joins, and we have um, index joins. The important thing to note here is that one side of the join is the document key. So on the joining side, you can build whatever expression you want as long as it generates the document key of the document that you're looking for. On the join side, you have no uh, other choice. At this moment in time, we do not support full expressions, but um, it's being considered. A um, couple of... Uh, other things, transactions, um, since you have denormalized um, your um, schema completely, all of the information will most likely reside in a single document, and document modification is atomic. So on that front, you, um, most of the time, you don't actually need transactions as such. What you're interested in though is consistency in the sense that once you've written something or once you've modified something, then you may care about being able to, um, to reading it back, or you may even care about reading stuff, in, stuff that is uh, completely consistent. And what you can do is set uh, the consistency level bought at the REST um, API level through the scan consistency REST parameter, or if you're using a um, SDK, you can essentially set it from the um, a lib couch base, and you go to see example right there. Finally, in monitoring, um, clearly, you, once you've got queries going, you want to see that they're running the way they are. And in Oracle and MySQL, you can turn on profiling or time statistics, and then you can have a look at um, dynamic views to see how things um, are going, or you can have a look at profiles. Similar way, you can explain statements. You can do exactly the same thing in Couchbase. We have um, REST um, endpoints to actually um, get um, complete request logs. We have um, key spaces to get the completed requests and active requests, and you can do 
some nifty aggregation to actually see what is more costly and um, just as much you can explain the statements. And again, the explain is a JSON document and you can, if you like, store stuff and do nifty aggregation on the plans as well. And with that, I leave you with Clarence. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'll be talking about data modeling, and uh, Brunt will be talking uh, how he has modeled the data for his application. So what is data modeling? Data modeling is designing the data such that it best suits your application. Okay, so data modeling is designing your data such that it best suits your application. It is essentially a progression uh, uh, from conceptual data modeling to logical data modeling to physical data modeling. And the best thing about data modeling is nobody is wrong about the data model. Everybody is correct, because it depends on his application. Just by looking at one's data model, I cannot say this data model is the right one. I need to know what's the requirement and what are the choices that one has uh, taken for his application. So let's first talk about uh, conceptual data modeling. So conceptual data modeling talks about the data from 10,000 feet. So you identify what, what are the various entities in your application. Say, in, a, in an airline application, I have airline, airport, route, say landmark, and passenger as various entities. And then I directly get into physical data model. Because usually, because of the lack of uh, tools in NoSQL, we do not go into the logical data modeling. So rather, we go into physical data modeling. So which maps entities, attributes, their relationship to the containers. So let's have a look at them. So uh, Marco had already told how you actually map. So do you, in relational world, you have databases. But in Couchbase, we do not have databases. Rather, we have buckets. So a mapping between database to a bucket has to be done. So how about table? Do we have uh, tables in Couchbase? No. We do not have, again, we have buckets and we have documents within the bucket. So how do you map to a table? So there is something that needs to be done for the mapping. So we'll talk about that in a while, but I think this is, it's, it's the choice that you have to do. Uh, it's, it depends on the choice that you're taking, the way how different mapping can happen. We'll discuss about that as well. How about rows? You do not have rows, probably each attribute makes a row of the similar type of the document. So what is the type that I'm talking about? So uh, I probably can have a type attribute within the document that classifies that document to be a certain type. So I can say the type attribute is pet. So all, all the documents with the type attribute as pet are going to be pet documents. Okay, and index, yes, we do have nickel indexes. So in physical data modeling, again, you have a document, you, uh, have relationship between documents. So data modeling approaches. When we talk about a relational world, we talk about normalization. What's the major agenda of normalization? Anybody? What's the whole idea about normalization? Consistency? Reduce duplication. Right? So to reduce duplication, of course, yeah, consistency is one way, but re uh, reduction of any kind of redundancy is what is uh, we focus. Uh, it's, it's nice, but what happens when you normalize and normalize and normalize? So it comes with a cost. The cost is the cost of joins. You join on this table and this table and this table to retrieve your data. But when we talk about uh, non-relational da databases or NoSQL databases, say Couchbase, we have relaxed normalization. So the advantage, the biggest advantage what we get with relaxed normalization is flexibility. Uh, it, uh, the flexibility and it, it supports clustered architecture. So you have any, any reduced server overhead. So what are the various choices that you need to do? Like I uh, already told, uh, when you document model your application, it's the various choices that you need to do. So what are the various choices? Because we know Couchbase does not enforce or it does not validate any kind of documents, right? So what are the various choices that impacts your JSON document design? So there's a choice between the single root attributes or the type parameter. So you can have type parameter or the single root attribute. 
say there's a choice between objects and arrays. When do you go with array? When do you go with objects? Objects being embedded. Array element types. How about timestamps? You might have to deal with timestamps, which is one of the most challenging things when uh, you're dealing with JSON. Uh, empty versus null versus missing attributes. It, it's quite possible that you some of the documents do not have an attribute, right? And JSON schema, how do you enforce a schema to a JSON document? So let's talk about the first one, the root attributes versus embedded attributes. Look at this document on your left. Uh, if you see the root attribute of the, the root attribute of this document is track. And everything is within that. While in the document on your right, you do not have the root attribute. Rather, there's an attribute called as type. Now, so there's a difference. So what happens, there might be multiple track documents which has the root element as track that classifies that is a track. While uh, in, in case of a different design, you might say a type attribute. So both are going to change your object model as well. And even your SQL queries are going to change. So for example, your nickel query here for this to access the document on your left would be, you know, I want to say select track dot star from say couch music, if couch music is the bucket name. Okay, so that would be the query. While the query to access the one in your right would be, you know, select star from couch music where type is equal to track. So there's a where clause. So I do not say this one is better than this one, but you need to understand uh, the overhead have of having the first one. The, the object model changes. The changes in the object model is what you need to take care of. The choice between object versus arrays. So have a look at the one again on your left. You have phones and you have the attributes embedded within phones. So phone is an object here. While in the one in your right, phones is an array. What if you have multiple phones? You have an array type. So again, I do not say this one is better or this one. It's the choice that we need to do. Okay, so how is this choice going to change our object model? We'll talk about that in a while. Next one is the array element types. The one on your left, you can see the tracks is an array. And it refers to IDs of, say, another document tracks, right? But one in your, on your right. So here you can see I have embedded objects of IDs. So the advantage with one on my right is I can have something called as partial embedding. So one on my left, I'm only doing a references kind of thing, like what you have foreign key references, right? So what happens, I, I retrieve the main document and I get the ID of, it, uh, ID of it and then get the secondary document. So it's like a foreign key reference. While the one in my right is I get the entire object and the object has tracks embedded within, that, within it. Okay. Well, I might not have full embedding here, I can have partial embedding, which means I embed only say, the ones which I most frequently need. For example, in my case in playlist, when I'm em embedding track, you most likely need the track ID, the track name, the artist name, and the track itself. While I do not embed the other things. So other things are left in its own document. So I get that advantage of partial embedding. So what is the uh, overall advantage of that? The overall advantage of uh, the second one is, you do not have to do multiple gets to retrieve that document. In one get, in one query, you retrieve the whole document. Okay, while in this, you'll have to do multiple gets. So when do you go with embedding? When do you go for referencing? I have a slide on that. Uh, I'll talk about that then. When talking about timestamps, we have several choices. In time, you know, storing, storing time, timestamps or dealing with timestamps has been always challenging. You can, since we are talking about flexible architecture and you can store JSON strings, so uh, you can store it in string format, the format the way how you want, or you can store it in epoch, and or you can store it as array of components. 
storing an epoch is a, is a easier way and it's like preferred by many of uh, the people using couchbase the reason is you can directly uh, run a query to sort it in a descending order say you want to retrieve uh, the tracks the most recently used documents you can uh, retrieve it by uh, say updated and sort it by descending order so that's going to sort it out storing it as array of components also can be useful especially when you are grouping it say here suppose i want to retrieve the documents from 2010 and 7 okay if i have to group from 2010 and 7 so there are functions available to do that especially when you're storing date in terms of objects so what are the other choices the choices is like how do you deal with empty versus null versus missing attributes so uh, empty attributes are the one which are like not valued while missing other attributes that are not available at all like it might be possible author okay is there author, within author children okay children are not, are not there so children are missing okay so uh, the reason why we wanted to have missing is since json supports optional properties so it, it's 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 a good thing to have missing json schema so we know that couchbase does not validate any schema Right? It does not validate any schema. So, but if you wanted your documents to adhere to some kind of schema, so you have JSON schema.org and, uh, and your JSON document can be validated against that schema. So, so more about these things, data nesting. So coming to denormalization, uh, we can do uh, multiple nesting. So what's the advantage of nesting? Have a look at this document uh, as an example of nesting. So you have a playlist document here, and you have a user profile document here. The playlist owner is referring to the document key of the user profile here. Okay, so how do you retrieve the document? You're going to retrieve the playlist document first, get the owner ID, and retrieve this document, correct? So which means you need to have two get calls while you could do it in a different way as well. So look at this. So what happens here, you have the same playlist document. Now instead of just the owner ID, okay, I embed not all the attributes, but some of the attributes here. So the advantage of that is, I retrieve this document here. When I retrieve this document, I of course get the playlist. Also, most of the owner, so probably the most uh, once that's most important one but if you want something more than this you can always do a call for uh, a different get for this as well okay all right so when do you go with uh, nesting or when do you go with references you know uh, take a look uh, at some examples say some kind of blogs okay so the blog id okay do you want to keep embedding all the blog posts within this this is going to increase the document size right and we know in couchbase uh, the document size limit is like 20 megabytes okay doesn't mean that we have to have 20 megabytes or a big document but it's it's not a wise idea to keep embedding the blog posts in a single document that's where uh, referring might be very advantageous, but in cases like this, where you want to retrieve the document in one go, uh, embedding works, works very well. Okay, so what are the various choices with key design? So we know Couchbase is a document database and stores data in key and value pairs, right? So and key, the key can take up to 250 characters or 250 bytes. So what, what can you do with the key? So when you're talking about the key, you, you can choose at, uh, some attributes from the real world as part of the key, like phone numbers, which are unique, uh, usernames, social security numbers, account numbers, or device IDs, which can be unique. So that can be part of a key. And usually, we always prefer to have your key as something that exists or that, that is formed from the attributes. So this is one way. The other way that is you can, you can have surrogate keys. That is, it is not formed from a natural key, right? So for example, it could be a UUID. So I can just say user colon UUID. That's going to be a unique key that's going to identify the document. If you have a natural key, we try to prefer going to that because 
uh, remember Couchbase is fastest when you do a get call. Okay, so if I say get user colon 101, that is way faster than saying you know select star from use uh, select star from bucket where user ID is equal to 101. That's way too faster because here you you need to do a GSI call. It's go it's going to the it's going to the query service, and then from query service it goes to the index node. The index node returns the documents of the IDs that should match the index, and then it's going to fetch the document and then return to you. Okay, but if you know the ID, it's 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 a direct call. It hits the data node, gets the document, and gives back to you. So Couchbase is fastest when you do the get call. Of course, in, if you're using nickel, you can always do the use keys, which is an equivalent get there. So the idea here is always try to model your key from a natural key so that you can try to access the document by its key instead of a nickel call. Okay, so what are the various trade-offs? Trade-offs like document keys, uh, document size, atomicity, document size, Couchbase is limited to 20 megabytes. And Couchbase works the best with small documents uh, which are of relatively small size. Atomicity, Couchbase does not support transactions. So that's something that you need to keep in mind. So if you want a transactional behavior, so you have to make sure it, uh, everything is covered within the same document because Couchbase is fully uh, consistent at the document level. It's fully atomic at the document level. The complexity of the document, uh, of the mapping of the document to its object model, the speed of access, so all these are the choices that you need to uh, think of. Okay. So when to embed, when to refer. So you usually go with embedding when uh, you want to retrieve the document in one get. Okay, that's when you go for embedding. So when do you refer? When the document goes larger and larger, or you think the document can go larger, it's, it's wise that you refer the document instead of embedding the document. While we always would recommend you know, partial embedding. So you do not embed the whole part of the document, rather only a sub part of the document. That's, that's much useful. So there is a session tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, where we'll be talking about agile data models, which uh, is uh, essentially this talk extended uh, uh, much more than what I'm talking now, okay? So over to Brent. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm Brent Burnett. I'm the lead developer at Center Edge Software. And I'm here uh, to talk to you about how at Center Edge we have been transitioning all of our cloud infrastructure from a SQL environment to a pure couch-based environment. And some of the pitfalls and issues and differences that we've encountered that we want to help make sure that everyone else doesn't encounter as well. So first let me give you just a really quick background. Uh, at Center Edge we are focused on on-premises uh, applications for the entertainment industry, uh, amusement parks, water parks, trampoline parks. Uh, and so we do their point of sale, their group and birthday party bookings, and then uh, on the cloud side, we handle all the online ticketing and sales, online birthday party bookings, uh, and uh, centralized reporting for franchise groups. We've recently started doing uh, centralized call centers uh, for party bookings for franchise groups. And so we're moving more and more of our infrastructure for all of these clients onto the cloud. Um, so why did we choose to go uh, with Couchbase for our, all of our new cloud platforms? One is that it's more uh, scalable and performant than traditional SQL. Our legacy online store system is actually currently running 19 SQL servers, uh, each one of which is hosting 30 stores, which means that when one of those stores hits a load spike, the other 29 on that same server suffer. Uh, it also makes it difficult for us to add more stores. We have to scale up more SQL servers. It's expensive and it's difficult to manage. Um, and also, if I need to scale a server vertically and go to a bigger server with more processor or more RAM, I actually have to take all 30 stores down during that time period to do that, unless I have some very advanced failover stuff in place. 
Um, the, the second reason is the schemaless JSON. Um, by going to a single couch-based cluster, we're getting very large sets of data that are available to us across all the stores rather than separate databases for each store. But by being schemaless, it means that as I continue to put new improvements out in that system and I add new attributes and start tracking new information I didn't before, there's much less in the way of going in and refactoring all of this existing data that's already out in this bucket. I can just uh, start reading the data differently and look for new attributes that weren't there before without needing to go in and update all six million customer records that are currently sitting in my data store. Um, and, and also, we were already using Couchbase very successfully, even for our legacy SQL system as our caching layer and also our shopping cart persistence layer, and have been since 2012. So we've had very good experiences with Couchbase and uh, all the new functions and technology they were rolling out with Nickel in the last year and a half uh, really uh, brought us on board and made us realize that it was now a, a viable solution as a replacement to SQL. Um, and so this is kind of what our, our current architecture is for our new cloud platforms. Uh, we're running data nodes, uh, which we do read and write from directly using key value as much as possible. Uh, like Clarence was saying, if you've got that document key and you know how to get to it, just pull it straight out. It's so much faster. Uh, but then we also have the query and index nodes, which we're using for pulling additional data uh, out to the web servers. Uh, and then also we're, we use the query nodes extensively uh, for actual application support, being able to go in and do diagnosis on, on issues and, and problems and be able to ad hoc query into the data in a clean way. So, so some of the things that we have learned over the course of, the, of our uh, transition is one, uh, Couchbase doesn't enforce the schema. So what we do instead is our data access layer enforces the schema for us. If we have customer documents going in and out of the database, then we only update them through a single service within our application. So all updates flow through that one service, which is using, in our case, we're uh, .NET, so we have POCO objects. If you're Java, there'll be POJOs or whatever other platform you're using that are reading and writing the actual data out of Couchbase. So that enforces our schema for us at the service layer rather than needing to do it at the database layer. Um, then uh, the other thing is when, when you do need to make schema changes that are in some way breaking, so more than just adding an attribute. Let's say, for example, we've got a single attribute that's storing a string. And we decide tomorrow that, you know what, we really needed to store an array of strings because we want to put multiple things in that, that one attribute. Uh, what we can do is actually customize the deserializer and allow it to detect is it a string or not and deserialize it in our object graph will just convert to always be an array. When it encounters a single string, it just makes an array of just one element. Um, and then is missing is a very good technique for noticing these schema changes. Um, so that you can know the difference between actually having a null value in the field, meaning I updated this document after my schema change and I put null in there, versus this is an old version of this document that that attribute was missing from. And so you use is missing to easily recognize that difference. Uh, and of course, try to predict your schema needs in advance. Like the example I just gave you with a, a, a string that needed to be an array. You know, if you know kind of where your product's heading six months from now, and you think six months from now, I'm going to need that to be an array, go ahead and make it an array. You'll just save yourself a little bit of headache in the long run. Um, the next thing is you want to pay attention to document modeling up front. So all this nice stuff Clarence was telling you about in his new talk that he's going to do later, you want to go to it. Uh, it's going to save you a lot of headaches if, if you get your data model right in the first place. So you don't have to go back and, and convert and change around when you discover that you made mistakes in your data model. Um, some of the mistakes we made, uh, documents getting too large. Uh, we had a case where we were trying to synchronize up data from a site and they added a new row to their local data table and it wouldn't synchronize up. And we looked at it and looked at it. We were digging in our logs trying to figure out why this one extra row got added to this table and it's, it's not syncing up. And we determined that our problem was we were hitting the 20 megabyte size limit. And that extra row was enough because all of those rows in SQL were being stored as arrays in a single document on the Couchbase server side. And each row 
in there with all of its nested subtables was hitting several hundred kilobytes and we were hitting a 20 megabyte limit. We also noticed uh, at the same time that that was what was causing our web servers to have sudden spikes up and down in CPU utilization to 100% as it was going through all the work of trying to deserialize that object into a full object graph to change one little thing and re-serialize the whole thing back. So you want to be uh, careful to make sure um, that you don't have that problem. The other thing that got us with that was also document contention. If I've got multiple people trying to edit different parts of that document at the same time, they're gonna fight with each other and they're gonna butt heads. Uh, and you're gonna end up with either rejecting because you're doing uh, CAS locking and rejecting one of the changes, or you're just gonna be taking a last one wins and losing the other person's changes. Um, but at the same time, spreading your data across too many documents also has downsides. Uh, the fact that you don't have atomic transactions means if I've got some piece of data that I know needs to be committed atomically, you want to make sure that that's all within that one document. Uh, if you do have to spread it across documents, you need to do extra control steps uh, to go back and attempt to roll back failures and, and do extra steps. It's not particularly common. The, the really nice thing is that with the nested data structures in Couchbase where you're not spreading the operations across 15 subsidiary tables, it's just one document, it means that you need transactions so much less. Um, and then also uh, spreading it out across is adding extra latency in your application because you're reading more documents to get your data, especially if you have to read one document first to get the key to read the second document, which has the key to read the third document, that's going to tend to draw out your, uh, your read process a lot more than if you just need, if you know I need these three documents and I already know the keys of all three up front, a multi-git will actually pull them in much more quickly. Um, and you want to make sure that you have your document keys available to you for joins. Uh, like Marco was saying earlier, when you're doing joins between documents, you have to be able to get that key to join. That's the only option currently in Nickel. So you want to make sure you design for that in advance. Um, sometimes it's nice to actually have it in both directions. So your parent document include a list of the keys of your child document as well as having the key of the parent and the child. Uh, it's not as necessary anymore since Couchbase Server 4.5, but it is helpful. Um, but you don't have to store the raw key. You can just reconstruct the key. But we find it easier to store the raw key. Uh, it just makes it easier to read, easier when you're doing manual querying to get between things without needing to know when I'm writing my query how to build the key. Uh, and then, uh, should I store my document key inside the document? Uh, at Couchbase, we have gone with storing the document key inside the document. Uh, technically, it increases your data storage size because the document has the key and then Couchbase's metadata also has the key. Uh, but it does uh, allow you to more easily work with it when you're doing your own queries and seeing the key without having to use additional meta functions and the like. Um, but one of the things we do is we use our data access layer to maintain consistency on that. So all of our uh, POCOs for our data access layer are inherited from a base object which has the key as, an, as a property on the base object and also has the document type as a property on that base object. So I know that that type attribute is always there on every single document. Um, and then the next thing you want to watch out for is uh, view indexes versus global secondary indexes. We actually started this project before Couchbase Server 4.0 came out. So we were using a lot of view indexes uh, because their global secondary indexes didn't exist yet. We've been transitioning to global secondary indexes for a lot more of our workload. So you want to watch out for some of the disadvantages of views. For example, views live on your data nodes, so they only scale with your data nodes. So if you need more view capacity, it means you're adding data nodes as well. Or if you add data nodes, you have too much view capacity. It doesn't participate in the multidimensional scaling like index and query nodes do. Um, additionally, when you're doing rebalances, uh, we found that the views really drag down your rebalances when you're adding additional nodes. Uh, but that being said, they do have their place, especially pre-aggregation of data for reports. It really helps a lot because views are built on MapReduce, so you can get that data summarized for you in your view and be able to quickly and easily pull that out and apply that in your reporting. Um, the next thing is, is watch out for indexes, so particularly your primary index. I know that that's probably been a, something that's come up in several of the talks here today. Uh, primary 
key scans in SQL versus primary key scans in Couchbase are very uh, different from each other. In SQL, if I miss my index and do a primary key scan on a table with 500 rows in it, it's not that big a deal. It's not the most performant, but it's only 500 rows it needs to read and check for you. In Couchbase, it's going to hit your entire bucket, uh, which in our case is several million documents, which is basically a guaranteed query timeout and a lot of system resources wasted while it tries to timeout. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not hitting uh, primary key scans. Um, it, also, the primary key scan is going to completely bust your in-memory cache on your data nodes as well. It, because it's going out and reading every single document to do that primary key scan, it means that any of the less commonly used documents that were just sitting on disk and not in RAM uh, now have been pulled into RAM to, to push out more commonly used documents as well. Um, so one of the uh, solutions that we use to help prevent this is every single query we write, we always have a type predicate in, in the where. So where type is equal to customer or where type is equal to order is in every single query that we write. Uh, as a result, if we include an index on our bucket that's just an index of the type attribute, it guarantees that at the worst, if we miss all of our specific indexes, we're going to fall back and we're going to hit this index on the type attribute, which means that now we're back into the performance profile that we would expect uh, in SQL, where it's a primary key scan of just the table, or in this case, just that particular type. And so this is actually some examples of some good indexes that we uh, have, have used and how we uh, typically write our indexes. This is based on the travel sample. Uh, the, the first one is just showing if you're an index that only applies to airports, put where type is equal to airport on your query. Uh, that does require that you also put where type is equal to air, airport on the query to match the index. Uh, but it just simplifies things and improves efficiency. The other thing is if you have an attribute that exists across multiple types, don't make an index for each type with that where clause on it. Make one index with type as the first column. And then uh, that way it will uh, reduce the amount of index work that needs to happen as mutations happen because you only have one index instead of, say, five, if you've got five different types that have IDs on them. And then the third is an example of the, the fallback index that I mentioned. Uh, the next thing is, as touched on earlier, date times. At Center Edge, we ended up going with ISO 8601 uh, as our method of storing date times. Um, it requires a little more work to work with it in nickel queries than it does storing it in a Unix epoch. Uh, but it does have the advantage that it's much more human readable. Uh, Clarence pointed out to me yesterday that something that some people do is actually store both into attributes side by side in the document, which is also a perfectly good solution. Um, so our rule is we store them as ISO 8601, uh, which includes a time zone specifier. Uh, but then we use uh, string to millis always in our queries. So if we're comparing two date times together being two constants or two values coming out of attributes, we're always going to wrap it in a string to millis call, which converts it to a Unix epoch before doing the comparison, which makes sure that it's going to take into account that time zone specifier. The trick to doing that, as you see in that query there, is to also do that on your index. Couchbase indexes support functions. You do not have to index just pure columns. By actually wrapping the index there in string to millis, it means that it's still going to be able to use that index when you're doing the comparison in the query above. Uh, so it ends up being uh, pretty highly efficient uh, without needing to go through uh, the fact that when I'm looking at my document, I'm sitting there staring at a Unix epoch number and I have no clue what it is without you know, pasting it into a web converter. Um, the other thing is to, to remember the index performance of mutations is a little different in Couchbase. Uh, I had this uh, slide up in my SQL presentation, on, on my link presentation this morning. The, uh, here I'm showing you the airline and airport SQL tables. And as you mutate those tables, it, SQL only needs to update the indexes related to just that table. Uh, if you update an airline, it doesn't care about your airport indexes. Uh, Couchbase, on the other hand, you have indexes on the bucket, which means that every mutation going into the bucket, whether it be a customer or an order or an airport, is always going to hit every single index on your bucket at the very least long enough to uh, deserialize it and check 
and see if that type attribute matches and whether or not the index applies to it or not. Uh, so that's why, for example, I recommended earlier, instead of having five separate ID indexes on each type, you do one index with type and ID. So that's one less, or four less indexes in that example that have to parse through these mutations. Uh, and then finally, training. Um, one of the great things I love about Nickel is how easy it is for developers to jump in on it. Uh, we had a developer start last year, and he was writing Nickel queries and running them the same day. Uh, it's so similar to SQL that you can do so much with it with, with very little training and just looking at the documentation. But don't assume uh, that that means that you don't need to do training. Um, the performance profiles, these index differences, you need to make sure your developers are up to speed on all these things. Uh, and also, don't forget your operations department. Uh, I have been managing our Couchbase clusters for the last uh, couple of years at CenterEdge, and as a developer, it's not my favorite thing to do. So now we actually have our sysadmin here this week uh, so he can learn uh, how to manage the operations side of it and take that over. So keep that in mind as well as you start to scale up your application to production. But that is all I have.